share a word with you this morning. Now, I've got to be honest. Look, Pentecostals, y'all going to get into this thing, okay? I prayed before I went to sleep a couple nights ago. I said, Lord, I need a word for this Sunday. We're starting Acts next week, but I need a word for this Sunday. And the Lord, the Lord gave me this thing in a dream. Now, before you go too crazy with that, keep in mind as well, I've had a cold all week, and I did something I don't usually do. I took NyQuil, and I've been having crazy dreams all week this week. In fact, uh, honestly, you're going to think I'm making this up. When I came in today, one of our response team guys named Jim Pierce was there. I said, Jim, you don't believe this, I, and I mean this. I said, I had a dream about you the other night. He said, what did you dream? I said, I dreamt that you were a certified genius. So if you know Jim Pierce, you know I'm on something if I'm dreaming that he's a certified uh, genius. And so, so this may or might, may not be from the Lord, but uh, it may be from the NyQuil. But we're standing on the brink of a new year. And every year, year after year, we do the same thing. God is doing a new thing. 2019 is going to be the year. It's going to be your breakout year. God does a new thing. And for most of us, he doesn't do a new thing. I've, I mean, honestly, I remember back in 2000, year 2000, this is a year. Forget Y2K. God is going to do a new thing in 2000, 2001, 2000. Year after year, we keep saying God's going to do a new thing. And he doesn't seem to be doing a new thing in some of our lives. And here's what I got this past week. I want, you to write, I want you to write this down on your study guides. And I mean this. This is so important. If you don't have a pen, use lipstick. And ladies, that goes for you as well. Um, here's what I want you to understand. You cannot experience the new until you let go of the old. You cannot experience the new until you let go of the old. And the light bulb went off this past week. That may be why some of us are not experiencing the new, because you can't let go of the old. Um, this past week, we opened Christmas presents as a family. My in-laws gave me a new shirt. I was so excited about the new shirt. I said, I'm going to try this thing on right now. Went to the bathroom to try it on. But you know what I had to do before I tried on the new shirt? I had to take off the old shirt. It wouldn't make any sense to say, let's see how this thing fits and put the new shirt over the old shirt. But some of us are trying to do the same thing. We're trying to make the new move of God somehow fit over this old thing going on in our life. It doesn't work that way. And so I want you to look at Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Uh, if y'all put that up there and leave it and <laughs> bring out your magnifying glasses and follow along with me here. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Look at this. God says, do not call to mind the former things, or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. I, the pastor said, hey, we got kids in here today. You're going to have to make it fast. I'm, I'm going to read that again. Give your kids some Benadryl and sedatum because I, I, I want to read this again. Here's what God says. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now, let me give you the background of this. Isaiah is actually writing this about 200 years before the event takes place. And so he's writing it as if God has already seen the event take place and he's kind of going in the past, okay? So none of this has happened yet. It's going to happen in the future. Now, what is the it that's going to happen? Well, if you look at the Old Testament, God's people... Israel, you know, it's divided into two. You had the ten northern tribes, the, the uh, two southern tribes. The two southern tribes had stayed faithful to God, and then even they started to abandon God. And God kept saying, please, do not abandon me. Do not abandon me. And you read some of the stuff these people did. It's horrendous. Any of y'all think that the Bible is a boring book? You've not read the Bible maybe in a translation you understand. If you read the translation you understand in the Old Testament, they did some really nasty, nasty stuff. And God kept sending prophets, don't abandon me, stay with me. And they said, no, we're not. So the day came where God says, that's fine, you don't want me to be your God anymore. I am now going to take my hand of protection away from y'all and see how you like it on your own. And when God did that, when God backed off and said, thy will be done, I'll let you guys do what you want to do, all of a sudden, like a, like a, a flood, 
a group of people, 586 B.C., called the Babylonians come in. The Babylonians are vicious. For some of you nerds, they're like the Klingons from Star Trek or the armies of Mordor from Lord of the Rings or whatever. These are vicious people. And they come in and they brutalize the women. They murder people. They burn people's house down. It's horrible. And they take God's people into captivity. They kidnap God's people for 70 years. It's not pleasant. In fact, it's probably the most destructive event in human history. When you see what these people did, it was, it was very, very bad. Now they've been kidnapped for 70 years, and God says, the time of you being kidnapped is over. I'm going to send you back home, and if you look there in verse 19, I'm now going to do a new thing. Now let me ask you something, you math geniuses. What comes before 19? 18. And so before 19 happens, before God does a new thing, look at verse 18. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Here's what God is saying. I'm not going to do the new thing until you forget the old thing. Now, what are some of the old things that God's people are told to forget? Well, first of all, I think they need to forget their enemies. Jot that down. They've got to forget their enemies. In other words, God is saying, the Babylonians remain vicious and cruel, but if you keep living in the past about how bad, vicious, and cruel, if you keep living the old thing, I can't do the new thing. Forget your enemies. Second thing that God's people have to forget are their tragedies. Yes, your houses were burned. Yes, your relatives were brutalized. Yes, horrendous stuff happened to you. But God says it's now time to stop living in the past. You're going to have to forget your tragedies, secondly. Third thing I think when God says you're going to have to forget, verse 18, you're going to have to forget your sin. In other words, you're going to have to forget what got you into this mess in the first place. Yes, you sinned. Yes, you rebelled. Yes, my punishment came. Yes, yes, yes. But now it's time to forget that, and I cannot do the new thing until you forget the old thing. Now, here's what the Bible says in places like Romans 15 and 1 Corinthians 10. It says, these things that happened in the past are written for our instruction. So what happened to the people in the Old Testament Somebody needs to listen to me in this place today. God is saying to you, I'm not doing the new thing until you forget the old thing. I'm not giving you the new shirt to put on until you take off the old shirt. I'm not going to do a new thing in your life as long as you keep looking in the past. You're going to have to forget if you're going to experience my new thing. Are y'all, you're just staring at me this maybe You know what? Here's what I realized. I don't mean that. I'm not trying to pay, play pity old Pastor Chad this morning. I realize that if I get no response this morning, this might just be for Pastor Chad. I realize God is saying to me, Chad, you wanted to do something new in your ministry, this church, your family? Chad, you're going to have to forget the past. Now, what are we going to have to forget if God is going to do this new thing? Number one, jot this down. Let me say this. Let me say this. Now, I did some research this past week. And some people say this is an urban legend. It never happened. Others say, no, 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 there's evidence that this did happen. I don't know if it happened or if it didn't happen, but it's a good sermon illustration, and I want to use it. And so it has been said that in the old days of the Roman Empire, if a man murdered somebody else, one of the punishments that the Roman government could inflict on that murderer was this. We are going to take your murder victim, the person you killed, and we're going to chain him to you. You will walk around with a corpse chained to your back. Now, that sounds bad on day one, but imagine what happens day 10, 15, 20 in the hot sun when this corpse starts decomposing, and now that decomposition is starting to infect you and make you sick. I don't know if that really happened or not, but if it did, that's a horrible punishment to walk around with a corpse chained to your body. Now, Pastor Chad loves you. And I love pastoring this church. My wife turned to me a little while ago. We're going to have to stock up on the Kleenexes because, bless her heart, she cries every service. And uh, I love this church. I love these people. Okay, I got it. I love them too. And, but here's the thing. I love you, but i got to say something hard to somebody right now. You will never experience life, physical, spiritual, emotional. You will never experience what living is as long as you have the corpse of this memory attached to your back. Something that was done to you, something you did to somebody, as long as this thing is chained to your back, you'll never experience life. It'll make you sick spiritually, emotionally, physically. Now, what are some things we're going to have to forget if God's going to do a new thing? Number one, you, like Israel, are going to have to forget your enemies. This whole thing of unforgiveness, you know how many times the Bible in the New Testament talks about unforgiveness? 
Again, I know some bad things were done for you. I know some things that were done that hurt you. But I want to show you how serious Jesus takes this thing of remembering how your enemies hurt you. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 15. If you do not forgive, your Father will not forgive you. I mean, am I reading the Bible wrong or is that what it says? Now, I don't believe this is talking about salvation. To understand what Jesus means, people wonder now, forgive. Does that mean forget? I don't know that you can forget sometimes. When something horrendous was done, it's there. Does it mean you justify what somebody did to you? He abused me. Is that okay? It's not okay. I'll tell you the word forgive literally means. The Greek word is aphiomi, and it means to release, to let go. I'm just going to say to somebody, it's time to let it go. You've been walking around this thing for 30 or 40 years. It's time to let it go. But what he did was wrong. I know what he did was wrong. What she did hurt me. I know she hurt you. It's time to let it go. Now, here's what I mean. When Jesus says your father won't forgive you if you don't forgive others, imagine that unforgiveness is like this. Here's the person that's hurt me. And in my mind, my spiritual hands are wrapped around their throat. For some of you, you've been locked in this position for the last 20 years of your life. Forgive means I let it go. Can I receive anything from the Father? Can I receive any kind of blessing as long as my hands are locked around somebody's throat? No, I can't. But the moment I say, I let it go, I release it. Now my hands are open to receive from the Father. Does that make sense? And so if God is going to do a new thing in your life, in my life, it's time to forget your enemies. Secondly, what do we need to forget? Well, just like Israel, we've got to forget our tragedies. Now again, some of y'all have experienced some things that I can never imagine. Pastor, you don't know what I've been through. I don't know what you've been through. You don't know what it's like to lose a child. I don't know what it's like to lose a child. You don't know what it's like to lose a spouse. I don't know what it's like to lose a spouse. But I believe this. Some of our identities in this place are wrapped up into something bad that was done for us years ago. I'm serious. Some of you, that is your identity. I remember I was talking to Pastor uh, Dick one time. He said, when I came back from Vietnam, I had been wounded. I experienced a lot in Vietnam. And so they told me, you need to go to a Vietnam veteran support group. So he said, the first meeting I went to of the Vietnam veteran support group, I go in and here's the whole meeting. I want you all to tell me how bad others were to you. What did the Viet Cong do to you? How bad did the government mess you up? What kind of reception did you get when you got home and people spat at you? He said, that was the first meeting I went to. Second meeting I go to, you know what they say? Let's go back over how bad people were to you. Let's go back over what you experienced in Vietnam. He said, I go back to the third group. You know what the third session was about? Let's go talk about how bad people were to you. What did you experience in Vietnam? Let's try to relive it. And he said, I can't do this. And he said, I left the group and I said, I don't want to keep reliving this. I want to leave it behind. Well, some of y'all doing the same thing. That's your identity. You're known as the abused one. You're known as the hurt one. You're known as the one that was treated unfairly. And at some point, you just got to let it go. I, uh, I know a lady whose husband died. He was viciously murdered. And by the time I met her, it happened about five or six years before, and she's still obsessed with his murder. Now, Pastor, you down? No, it's, I don't know what it's like to have a spouse murdered. She said, it's very traumatic. First time I met her, she talked about how traumatic it was. Next time I met her, she said, did I tell you about my husband? I said, the one that was murdered? Yeah, and she told me the story again. And then I watched in small group meetings, and they would bring up some Bible verse, and she said, you know, that reminds me of the time my husband was murdered. We'd have big get-togethers at Thanksgiving and Christmas, and she'd say, you know, before we have this Thanksgiving dinner, have I told you about my husband that was murdered? Can you? That just sucks the air right out of the room. I'm going to tell you something. At some point, she had to stop this identity of being the woman whose husband was murdered and said, I will never forget him. I love him. He was a great husband, but that's in the past. And when she finally let it go, God brought a great man into her life that really loved her and cared for her as well. She couldn't experience the new thing until she forgot the old thing. Again, that's, now look, hey, I, I hope, I, look, I hope that I never die before my wife. I hope she doesn't die before me. I hope the rapture comes and God just brings us both together, all that kind of stuff. And I want to be the kind of husband that if I do go first and she remarries, when that guy dies and gets to heaven, he's going to look at me and say, I hate you. All I heard is about how great a husband you were. That's the kind of husband I want to be. <laughs> and so I'm not saying forget the child that died. I'm not saying that. 
I'm not saying forget the spouse that died. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying forget the people. I'm just saying forget the tragedy. You will not be able to experience the new thing until you forget the old things. Make sense? All right, let me give you a third thing. So Got to forget the enemies. Got to forget the, the mess, the tragedy. And the number three, you, like Israel, you're going to have to forget the sin that got you into this mess in the first place. And this is the hardest one. I think it's easier to forget a tragedy. I think it's easier to forget of an enemy, enemy than it is to forgive yourself for what you've done. And this is for somebody here today. If you're a born-again believer and you messed up and you messed up royally, confess it to God, repent of that sin, and let it go. Now, I'm telling you, seriously, every time some of y'all look in the mirror, you see this, adulterer. Why? Because of something that happened 20 years ago. Every time you look in the mirror, you see embezzler. Why? Because of a bad, now, if you need, look, if you need to make restitution, make restitution, whatever. But I'm just saying, at some point, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ either covers us from all of our sin, either the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, or it does not. Does this make sense? And I'm, I'm just telling you, some of us have done some really bad stuff. Some of us have done some really stupid things. Some of us are reliving those things every day. And I'm telling you, you, you're not experiencing the new thing until you get the old thing. Are you with me on this, church? In fact, I, I love this great story of Augustine. Augustine of Hippo was an early church leader. But before he got saved, the guy was a reprobate. I mean, he did all kinds of really wicked stuff. And then he gets radically saved. And he understands that in Jesus Christ, you're a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And so there's a story that one day Augustine was sitting in his house, and there's a knock at the door. And his servant answered the door, and it's an ex-girlfriend with whom he did a lot of this stuff. And she's there, and she doesn't know he's been saved. And she says to the servant, I want to see Augustine. The servant says, Augustine don't want to see you. She says, no, no, you don't understand who I am. The servant says, I know who you are. Augustine doesn't want to see you. She kept demanding that Augustine let her in. And finally, she runs to the other side of the house, runs underneath Augustine's window, and she shouts, Augustine, Augustine, it's me. And Augustine looked out of the window, and he says very quietly, oh, but it's not me. It's not me. That old me is dead. He is gone. And some of you need to understand that through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of God the Father, it's not you. That you is dead and gone, and yet you keep reliving it. I don't understand that. Here's two yeah buts. People give me. Yeah, but, number one, what I did was really, really bad. God can't forgive me. God can't forgive you. Do you understand you've just uttered a blasphemous statement? If you say what I have done is too big for even God to forgive me, you're saying... The magnitude of my sin is greater than the power of God. And beloved, there ain't nothing greater than the power of God. Second thing some of y'all are saying is, yeah, but I kept repeating the sin. I'd sin, I'd do okay for a couple of days, I'd fall back into the mess, and I would legitimately come to the Father with tears and repentance and say, God, I want to do right. And 10 days later, I'm back in the same mess again. And so God won't forgive me. Can I read you a verse from Luke 17? This is Jesus talking. You think Jesus knows what he's talking about? Okay, so here's what Jesus says. For those of you who say, God could never forgive me because I kept repeating the same sin over and over again. Here's what Jesus says. Luke 17, 3. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and returns to you seven times that day saying, I repent, then forgive him. Do you understand what Jesus just said right there? He said, if somebody sins against you, and seven times in one day, they are truly repentant, and they come back seven times and say, look, I'm sorry, I don't know why I keep doing this. Jesus says, you're to forgive them. Now, let me ask you a question. You think Jesus would hold you to a standard that he's not willing to hold himself to? If Jesus says, you need to have unconditional and unlimited forgiveness, then don't you think Jesus is willing to offer you and me unconditional and unlimited forgiveness? So I'm just saying to somebody here today, it's time to let it go. Let the enemy go. He's been chained to your back for the last 10 years. He's rotting and decomposing, and it's making you sick. Let it go. 
I'm saying to somebody here today, you have had this bad memory chained to your back for 20 years. It's time to let it go. I'm saying to some of y'all, there is a sin that you have committed that has been chained to your back. It's been decomposing for the last 10 years, and it's making you sick, and God won't do the new thing until you let go of the old thing. Now, when that happens, look at this. When you let this stuff go, now I'm going back to verse 18. Forget, don't recall. God says, don't even recall it. Don't even talk about it. Can I tell you something? I've had to do the same thing. I'm going to tell you, there was a mini, M-I-N-I, not M-A-N-Y, M-I-N-I, a mini breakthrough in my life this past year. Darla was with me. We were talking to a couple that's going through a very tough time in ministry, not in our church, another church. And I said, oh, I, know, I know exactly what you're going through. I went through the same thing. And I recounted a story of how somebody was really bad to me in ministry and my reaction. And I, I felt good. You ever feel good when you're starting to get really mad and the adrenaline starts pumping again? And when I got through that story, here's what the Spirit of God said to me. Don't ever talk about that story ever again. It's time to let that story go. And when I made a resolution to let that go, there was a breakthrough in my life. God wants to do the same thing with some of you. Now, two things will happen when you let these things go and God does a new thing. Look at this in verse 19. I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Look at those two things. Roadway in the wilderness. Jot this down beside it. Put the word direction down. D-I-R-E-C-T-I-O-N, direction. Look, I genuinely believe this. If you will say, I'm letting this thing go. This decomposing thing's been on my back for too long. I'm not going to talk about this, think about this, go over this. I'm going to forget this thing. If you'll let that thing go and let God do a new thing, you're going to find new direction in your life. You've been going this direction. Sometimes it's healthy. Sometimes it's unhealthy. It's wearing you out. You let God do a new thing. It says right there, I'm going to make a way, a new direction in the wilderness. I believe if today we let some stuff go, it's a new direction. In fact, I told first service, I thought, I was about to say I bought a new truck. To me, it's new. I bought a 2007 uh, truck recently. And the one thing this truck didn't have that I wish it did have, and most of y'all's cars have it, are those little backup uh, camera things, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know what's happening to my spatial skills. The older I get, I can't park my vehicle anymore, and I can't reverse things. I, I go all over the place. I wish I could have one of those little mirrors where you put it in reverse, it's beep, beep, and it just kind of shows as you're backing up. Let me tell you something. The people who created those backup cameras did not design you to look at those cameras going 70 miles an hour down the interstate. They are temporary. You put the car in reverse, and for the next 30 seconds, you use it to get out of the driveway. But, buddy, when you put that car in D, it's time for the camera to turn off, and it's time for you to move forward. And some of y'all have been spending your life the last 10 years looking at the past, looking back. What happened in the past? How badly was I hurt? How stupid was I? And it's time to put this thing in drive and say, it's a fresh start. It's a new beginning. Turn the camera off. It's time to move ahead. Look at the second thing that will happen. I will make rivers in the desert. Jot this word down, delight. God will give you direction and he will give you delight. If you're in the desert and you're thirsty, the best thing in the world is to have a cold, fresh stream come right by you. God says there's something liberating about just letting it go. Do you know how much physical, mental, emotional energy it takes to hold on to the past? It's wearing some of us out, honestly. And when you finally say, forget this stuff. I was a bonehead. He was a bonehead. They were stupid. They did stupid stuff. I did stupid stuff. Forget it. Let's let it go. When, when you finally say, forget this thing, there's a refreshing that comes over you. In fact, I was reading something from Charles Fuller at uh, or, or uh, Charles uh, Kraft at Fuller Theological Seminary. He talked about deliverance sessions that he would be in. And he says, in some of these deliverance sessions, I would talk to people with significant back and shoulder pain, debilitating back and shoulder pain. He said these pains disappeared almost immediately after releasing pent-up anger through forgiveness. Dr. Rita Hancock, medical doctor writing in the Christian Woman magazine, said that she's seen a link between unforgiveness and some medical conditions like food allergies, fibromyalgia, arthritis, and intestinal disorders. And when people let it go, many times these things just dry up. Now, how in the world, let's close this thing down. Well, Pastor, you said let it go. How? How do I let it go? Look right here. Let me see your pretty little eyes, okay? Look. look. How do I let it go? Give it 
to Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you something. That thing that was done to you that you have right now, it's a real thing. I mean, it really happened to you. That thing you did, it happened. You did it. Something's got to happen to it. And here's what I believe. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came down from heaven to earth, and Jesus said, I will take your sorrow, your sin, your mess-ups, your hurts upon myself, and I will die, and I'll pay the price for those things. And I'll rise from the grave, and I'll give you my resurrection power. So the best thing you can do with these hurts, with these sins, with these tragedies, is say, Jesus, it's now yours. I give it to you.